Class of 2020 is in. Very good. Well, look, thank you all for joining us. And can I start uh, today by, you'll be pleased to know that uh, the National Cabinet is a red tape cutting organisation. And we've agreed today that uh, I'll make a, a brief statement at the start and then, then we'll go to questions. Uh, uh, the old COAG arrangements would have had us here most of the afternoon um, at this press conference making statements, and so I thank the Premiers and the Chief Ministers uh, for further streamlining action by the National Cabinet. Um, Australia is working together. We're working together, and Australia is coming back from COVID-19 uh, on the health front, on the economic front, on so many. And I want to thank my colleagues who are here with me today uh, and Premier McGowan joining us remotely for the amazing job they have all done individually in their own jurisdictions in Australia's toughest year in generations. But I also want to thank them for their tremendous support working together with each other, uh, but also with ourselves as the Commonwealth as part of this innovation of the National Cabinet. Um, this has been a, a very important group, uh, a very important leadership group for this country, bringing together our Federation, seeing it work in a way that this country, I don't believe, has ever seen. And so I'm indebted to all of my colleagues here. We all run our own governments. Our own cabinets are paramount in the decisions that we make federally here and, of course, in each of the state and territory jurisdictions. But the way we keep coming together, we get into the room, we get things done, and I thank my colleagues very much for their cooperation and support. We're also joined by uh, Professor Kelly and uh, the ACT uh, Australian of the Year. Our Professor Brendan Murphy, I'm sure the ACT Chief Minister would give a good, big shout out to Brendan, uh, and they'll be joining us to answer questions on vaccines and the normal, uh, the, the normal uh, health issues that come up at our post-national cabinet briefing. Uh, today we had the opportunity uh, to discuss the vaccine issues that uh, the Health Minister and I reported on earlier today and talk through further issues around the vaccine rollout, making very good progress there, and I'm sure you'll have questions, but uh, we're on track uh, for that rollout and working closely together together with the states and territories uh, for what is a very unique rollout of vaccine. Uh, the states and territories are always partners in the, the administration of any vaccine and we absolutely trust them as you'd expect us to because we are partners in the delivery of health services around the country. This is a very unique vaccine and a very unique rollout and so the bespoke arrangements we have here though continue to build on that partnership. We also uh, agreed today um, the need to tighten some uh, arrangements, particularly around air crew uh, and as well as on diplomats. Uh, these are the vulnerabilities that uh, I wouldn't say are at a, a great scale, but they're important vulnerabilities. As the year goes on and as our success continues, the states and territories become even more laser-like focused on the areas where potential vulnerabilities can emerge. And so we had good discussions on how we can tighten arrangements in, in both of those areas, working both bilaterally with the Commonwealth as well as together. Um, it was also very important today, we agreed that we could go forward on developing bilateral arrangements for seasonal workers in Australia. Each of the states and territories are, are, are confronted with different circumstances on the ground and, and different capabilities and capacities. In Queensland, for example, there's been a very, very successful on-farm uh, quarantine for seasonal workers program that has been underway and has really been supporting the Queensland agricultural sector and the primary producers. Um, but now we want to ensure that we can uh, move to other arrangements in states and territories where that, is, where that need is critical. Uh, Premier Andrews, I know that it's a, it's, a, it's a very important issue in Victoria presently as it is in many other states, and we've agreed that bilateral arrangements will be made on the health, uh, health orders that will be um, applied to seasonal workers coming into states, and that will unlock the ability for the Commonwealth to then provide seasonal worker visas, um, which will confine those seasonal workers in those jurisdictions so they remain completely under the health control of those states and territories. 
and that will be resolved in the bilateral arrangements that exist between states and territories in the Commonwealth. We also agreed a very practical emergency services, fire services protocol um, for the upcoming, and we're very much in it now, uh, summer season. And that is just a very practical set of arrangements because, you know, we move emergency services and other work, um, uh, uh, volunteers and workers around the country in the course of um, uh, disaster seasons. And uh, that has been a piece of work that has been underway by officials for some time. Just a very cooperative and practical piece of work. Uh, other issues we agreed on the economic front today, uh, the progress of the job trainer program. It's now operational in all states and territories bar the Northern Territory, and that will be very soon um, implemented in the Northern Territory. This is a game changer for young people in particular, but people of all ages who are changing careers, the additional places. It's a big partnership. It's a big financial partnership, a billion dollar partnership between the Commonwealth and the states and territories on top of our existing commitments to vocational education and training. Um, and data sharing is, is important to ensure that program stays up to the mark. We also agreed today on two important regulatory congestion busting uh, initiatives that we've discussed on earlier occasions. The first one is uh, with the, with the uh, EPBC Act, which as you'll know federally is the subject of uh, changes that we're seeking to pursue as a Commonwealth government. Uh, Premier's Chief Ministers and I agreed today is that the first priority, the first priority is to ensure we streamline the administrative processes. Samuel's review, which will be released soon, um, will make recommendations as the interim reports have flagged on environmental standards at a Commonwealth level. But what is important in the first tranche of legislative change, and the priority is to ensure that the existing standards that relate to the existing legislation and regulation, no more, no less, must be codified and that we can streamline the approvals process to a single touch decision that occurs at the state level. Now, we estimate that at a Commonwealth level a few years ago to be costing the Australian economy almost half a billion dollars every year. For projects that should go ahead, they should comply with the environmental standards and the regulations. That will occur. There will be important um, reporting arrangements that ensures compliance with those uh, standards as they're administered by the states and territories. But we all agree it needs to happen faster and it needs to happen in accordance with the standards that we have now. A second phase, after we're able to legislate those arrangements, is to take into account the recommendations of the Samuels Review that may make recommendations about any improvements or changes to those standards more broadly. But we don't have to solve that problem in order to solve the first problem, which is making things go faster. To that end, we also agreed today um, that uh, the Commonwealth has supported to lift the threshold uh, for infrastructure Australia, infrastructure Australia assessment of co-funded projects by the Commonwealth from $100 million to $250 million. This will free up Infrastructure Australia to focus more on the big projects and it will declog the process in getting these projects moving sooner. We want to see these projects on the ground because it's a critical part of the economic recovery that will continue in 2021. And today, seven states and territories, and I don't think it'll be too long before ACT um, comes on board as we resolve a couple of issues which are quite bespoke to the ACT and its geographic arrangements more than anything else, is mutual recognition of occupational registration. This doesn't sound like a, a terribly um, uh, illuminating issue or one that's going to capture national attention, but I can tell you, if you're a tradie and you need to have multiple registrations as an electrician or some other worker because you're moving between um, states and territories, it's a pain and it costs you money and it slows your business down and it costs jobs. And I want to particularly thank the treasurers um, as part of the Council of Federal Financial Relations who have done the heavy lifting on getting that agreement today and seven states and territories have uh, committed to that and indeed I understand signed that today. Next year we're going to stay focused. We're staying focused on the recovery, uh, both on the health side and the economic side. The National Cabinet, we all agree, is a great privilege to be involved in, each and every one of us. We take those responsibilities and our respect for each other very seriously, and that will continue to provide the platform for what I think 
has been a game changer in the Australian Federation this year. And we want to see that game change impact so many other issues. This afternoon, the Federation Reform Council will meet and an issue that is close to every single one of our hearts is mental health and the need to work together to address the gaps that occur in mental health uh, across Australia. We all have responsibilities here, and this year has taught us just how important people's mental health is in this country. It's reminded that of the, the, us of that again, and we look forward to applying this very effective mechanism to solving those difficult challenges. And with that, I will throw to questions. Um, on, the, um, on bringing people into the country mm. and hotel quarantine, mm. Uh, what's the thinking in National Cabinet about, about the capacity of the system to bring in more people? And I'm not just thinking about Australians who want to return home, I'm thinking about workers and also um, foreign students that the universities want for next year. I know there are different views around National Cabinet, but what's your thinking? Is there any consensus about what happens next? And are there any Premiers, for instance, Queensland Victoria, who might want to comment on the capacity of that system? Well, I'll, I'll speak briefly and then and my colleagues will as well. Uh, our first priority as Commonwealth Government is Australians and Australians returning home. And I want to thank all the Premiers and Chief Ministers for the work they've done. Uh, I must say, particularly New South Wales, because they carry half the burden for the country. And they're not all New South Wales Australians returning. They are Australians from all across the country who find themselves coming through uh, New South Wales. Um, uh, Victoria has begun again, and uh, the Premier and I are looking forward to seeing that uplift in the new year um, as we work through uh, the capacity and, and have quarantine fully functioning again in Victoria. That will add additional capacity. Queensland and, and Western Australia have both up their capacity, and this is a very productive, I think, working relationship. But what we all understand is there are physical limitations on the hotel quarantine capacity, but that is the safest and most effective way for people to come home and quarantine. I think we all agree that the health standard on quarantine is the most important issue. Where we can create capacity for people to return who are non-residents, who are uh, non-Australian citizens, such as on seasonal workers, then we can develop the bespoke arrangements, which Queensland particularly has done on on-farm quarantine, which provides over and above capacity to see those economic needs met. But the first priority is the quarantine capacity for returning Australians and residents, and uh, that will continue to be our focus. Where we can create additional net capacity above and beyond that, that doesn't uh, prevent an Australian returning to the country, well, we remain very open to that, but I'll leave it to others to make comments. Well, well PM, I might just add quickly, uh, the first thing to do is on behalf of all Victorians, thank uh, principally New South Wales, but all other first ministers from across the country who have uh, been required to have more and more people in their hotel quarantine systems because ours was closed for a period of time. It's now reopened. Uh, the Prime Minister and I had a conversation last night about us lifting our numbers and we're very confident we'll be able to do that, but that's got to be done safely. Uh, and uh, I think we'll, we'll get to the end of the summer and we'll certainly be uh, processing more people uh, and I think significantly more people uh, than we are now. That's just got to be done in a steady way. On, on workers, particularly for our uh, horticulture uh, industry. Uh, if we want to guarantee uh, economic activity, we want to guarantee that those crops are in fact harvested, uh, that fruit is picked, uh, stores are full and people can buy the products that they love at anything like an affordable price, then we have to find a way forward here. We need 15 to 20,000 workers and no hotel quarantine system will be able to cope with that. But we've had a really good, really good discussion last night and again today, and I'm very grateful uh, uh, Premier Palaszczuk shared her the, the best-in-class system of farm quarantine with us. We'll learn from that, and we're also continuing to work with, uh, with Dr Kelly uh, around some other uh, countries where a bubble might be able to be set up. Again, always safe. Uh, we've reintroduced hotel quarantine, we're growing it but I really just wanted to take the opportunity, to, and your question allows me to, to say thank you to my colleagues for having shouldered uh, more of the burden than they probably expected to. When Mr McGowan said he wouldn't be attending in person, he's the only leader not to. Is it disrespecting the national cabinet process? 
Not, not at all. Not at all. We were heartbroken, of course, that Mark couldn't join us here. Almost as much as him. <laughs> Almost as much as him. And it's OK. WA gets to keep the GST. No, There's not don't. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, Mark, together with all my colleagues here, have, have made great contributions to this group. And we understand every state and territory has its rules, and those rules need to be held up to. And uh, so we understand, but obviously uh, miss our colleague, and we look forward to him joining, joining us next year. And we look forward uh, to, I look forward to coming to Western Australia again and seeing him there. Um, we wanted to get Australia open by Christmas, and we're going to achieve that, I believe. We are going to achieve that. And uh, that has been made possible, I think, by the patience and the steady work of everyone you see here in front of you. And I think that should be a great encouragement to Australians. Even when we disagree from time to time, we keep moving forward. We keep looking to the next thing we have to do. And uh, things that have happened behind us, they stay behind us because, frankly, we've got too, in, too important a job to do. So we miss you, Mark. We miss you. Pointed to for seasonal workers. We know the New South Wales Premier is keen to see international students uh, back in Australia very important for the economy. Could you see a scenario where there are bespoke quarantine arrangements on university campuses? And we've also heard potentially that there may be um, some sort of plan for that in Victoria. I know there's a few questions there, but would be keen to hear your plan for international students. Well, again, it's Australian citizens and residents returning first. That's the priority for hotel quarantine in Australia. Um, of course, we want to see uh, a resumption of so many aspects of the services trade that Australia has, and international students is an important part of that. But that cannot come at the cost of Australian citizens who have every right to return to their home country, particularly when we see around the world um, the great distress that the rest of the world is. I mean, here we sit as a group presiding over with the great with the great efforts of Australians, Australian businesses and workers and, and health workers and everyone who's done such an amazing job, and you compare that to what is happening around the rest of the world, uh, then Australia is in a very select group of countries. And uh, that is through no small effort from those who sit around me here uh, on, around this table. And so on international students where net additional uh, capacity can be safely established, then that is something we've always been open to. But that must satisfy uh, the public health requirements of the states and territories who have jurisdiction over those things. And it can't take away from an Australian's ability to come home, and that is our requirement. So you know, where, where that can be achieved, I think the guardrails are set pretty clearly on that. I know states uh, are keen to see that, um, that international services opportunity return, but I know they also are very committed to seeing Australians come home. But Gladys, did you want to? Oh, sure. Thanks, PM. Um, as you know, we're bringing back 3,000 Aussies every week through New South Wales. 45% of those actually go on to other states and 55% are staying in New South Wales. Um, the Prime Minister's made his position very clear, which I support in relation to getting Aussies back home. But I would like to have a conversation next year, not just about international students, but also about skilled migrants. And that's a conversation we can have next year. But clearly, the priority is to try and reduce the list of Aussies coming back home. And I completely support the PM in that. Uh, but I do think at some stage next year, we do need to broaden the conversation. I'm not happy to see the quarantine system move outside of the hotels at this stage. I think that would be too high a risk. Uh, uh, that's just New South Wales. I know other states do have other, op um, other arrangements. Uh, and so for that reason, the cap of 3,000 um, is, is not going to change in New South Wales. And so it's, it's a question about uh, when Victoria comes online and other states come online, how far can we eat into the 39,000 Aussies that are still waiting to come home? And once that's dealt with, I'm sure there'll be opportunities for us to consider all those other categories which will boost our economy and prospects for jobs in the future. Yeah, and so we, we agreed to come back to that in, in January and we're constantly monitoring that level of, of Australians who are seeking to come home, but I can confirm that 45,954 Australians have returned uh, since uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 18th, I think it is, of September. And at that time, you'll recall, there was 26,200 Australians who are registered to come back. And so we've got home 45,954. Um, we still have right now registered overseas some 38,655, um, but we will continue to monitor uh, through contact directly with people overseas about their need to return home. That may change over the next month. 
that may change as vaccines are introduced, particularly in the United Kingdom, uh, which is one of the key areas uh, where Australians are seeking to come home from. The biggest uh, area, the biggest number of people seeking to come home is from India. There's over 10,000 there. Um, there's around about just under 5,000 in the UK. Um, and then there's a range of other countries. Andrew? Can I uh, ask about the contact tracing? In recent months, uh, You've been complimentary of New South Wales and Queensland's systems. Um, you've been um, less complimentary about Victoria. Uh, are you now uh, confident that the system of contact tracing is consistent and of uh, good enough standard uh, across the country? I'd like the good professors at the back to uh, venture a view on that. But also, with regards to the fellow on the screen, do you think uh, WA is match fit when it comes to contact tracing as well. Well, I'm going to I'm going to throw that to uh, both Paul Kelly and, and Brendan Murphy because my view on that is based on their advice. And uh, in Australia, particularly over the last six months, there has been an absolutely significant investment that has been made by the states and territories at looking and learning from each other to ensure that their contract tracing systems are world standard. And uh, New South Wales, you know, I've been very, very clear about, I think has led the way in that area. But what we've seen most recently, and, and um, Premier Marshall may want to comment on this, particularly in relation to Western Australia, one of the things that the contract tracing system, I think, has achieved more recently is the ability of, the, of its federal capabilities, and by that I don't mean the federal government, I mean the states and territories swarm to support a problem. Now, when we had the issue in South Australia, the state that actually did the most in support of South Australia, it's fair to say, was Western Australia. And the match fitness of Western Australia's contact tracing system was one of the key things that was assessed um, uh, in the Finkel review, which we've reported on previously. But there has been an enormous amount of sharing and learning between jurisdictions in this issue. Now, you know, that's not to say every system has been perfect. And I, I wouldn't agree with the way uh, that you suggested I'd characterised other systems at all. Um, I've tended to focus on the positives. What, what I think is important, though, is all the states and territories have worked together, learned from each other, supported each other. And now where I have a great confidence is if it happened in Queensland or in Western Australia or in the Northern Territory, there is a national effort that can be brought to bear on contact tracing with the support of one system to another. But um, Paul, did you want to speak about that? Um, thanks, PM. So uh, I'd, I'd just to echo the PM's uh, summary there. We did have Professor Alan Finkel, the, uh, the chief scientist, lead uh, a national review of contact tracing and looked at all of the elements for, of, of uh, testing, tracing and isolation. And his conclusion was that all the states were actually strong. Um, we've learnt through this epidemic um, and, uh, and we are supporting each other. There were 22 recommendations in that, in that report and we're, we're working through those. Some of them are completed, um, particularly the issue of data exchange across borders. And so Victoria, uh, New South Wales and the ACT are start, uh, have, have uh, progressed that work uh, with the Commonwealth over the last month. And so all of those things gives me great uh, uh, confidence in the in what we can do as a nation, but also in all of the states. What is your position on vaccinating Australians currently overseas? And once Australians have been vaccinated here, will they be free to travel at will overseas to holiday and for work? Well, on, on the latter point, these are still decisions that are still to be taken. And to that end, I might throw to uh, uh, Professor Murphy, who is leading uh, the Commonwealth's uh, vaccination strategy and also its role, eh, Brendan? Thanks, PM. I think we still don't know uh, what the vaccines will do in terms of complete prevention of transmission of the virus. So the vaccines can prevent disease. We know that very clearly. The extent to which they will effectively prevent, for example, asymptomatic transmission or people bringing the virus with them when they travel, we still have to find out. So. We're, this is an evolving place and we'd, there may well come a, a time when we have evidence that vaccines are very good at preventing people contracting the infection. In that circumstance, it may be appropriate to allow quarantine free travel, but this is an evolving space and we just have to watch and wait as it develops. 
make a decision because a lot of people would like to start planning for the future and, and the such? I think, that, I think over the course of next calendar year, as we get more and more information on more and more vaccines, we'll have a much clearer picture. Prime Minister, Prime Minister. Pfizer vaccine has received approval in the UK and the US. Why can't Australia now also give the vaccine approval? And Greg Hunt mentioned this morning that 10 million um, units was appropriate for Australia. Why? Don't we need to buy more of this vaccine? Well, I'll, I'll throw, again, I'll, I'll, I'll direct that to Professor Murphy. On the issue of the accreditation approval of vaccines in Australia, we'll do that on Australian rules with Australian officials and on the Australian timetable. Australia has one of the highest rates of vaccination in the world. The reason for that is we take these issues incredibly seriously and we have the best people in the world making those decisions to protect the safety of Australians. We want to ensure that Australians, and I think all of us feel very strongly this way, have full confidence, absolute full confidence, that when it gets the tick, they can get the jab and they can make that decision for themselves and for their families confidently. So we're aware of what is happening in other states and, uh, and other nations around the world. We have a front row seat, frankly, as, as they go through that and uh, work through any potential issues that, that may arise. And the data sharing arrangements that we have, particularly with the United Kingdom, will be very instructive, I think, as they are the first ones to go around the block on this. Um, but. There's a difference between what's happening here in Australia and what's happening overseas. Overseas, vaccination is the, the only thing they've got, frankly now, to address what is a, a, a level of uh, communication of the virus mm -hmm. that is happening in the community in those places. Because of the hard work done by Australians here and the arrangements that have been put in place um, by all those you see in front of you and our governments, Australia is not in that situation. So that means we can make this decision in the same way we always would, carefully, based on the best science. So when I tell you that it's safe to happen, I can do that with the greatest possible confidence that I can. And that's what I owe to every Australian and particularly every parent. Uh, Brendan, did you want to add anything to that? Or? I'll just to say that on, as, the, as the Prime Minister said, we're not in the position of having to do emergency use registration for a vaccine, which is how the Pfizer vaccine has been registered in those countries. We have the time to take our normal uh, process through the TGA. Uh, we, are, we continue to look at the mRNA vaccines and uh, around the world, but I wouldn't underestimate the huge value of what we announced today, that we are now having full population coverage of an onshore manufacture of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Onshore manufacturing is a very precious thing in terms of getting good access over the course of next year. So we will continue to look at the mRNA vaccines uh, over time as well. Uh, why were warnings about the likelihood of a false positive HIV for the University of Queensland vaccine? Why were those warnings ignored and how much taxpayer dollars have been wasted here? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll let Brendan also speak to the, to the medical issues here. Every cent we have invested in getting the best and most early available and safe vaccines for Australians in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic has been money well spent, every single cent. I mean, there are no guarantees when it comes to vaccine development. And if you don't put the investment in across a range of opportunities and options, then you don't get one come out the other end. And I think uh, the expectation that there would be a 100% success rate across these is, is naive. It's just not true. And Australia has made the right investments in science. We've made those decisions based on the best scientists and expert medical advice as to where we should place those investments. And the net result of that is now not just three vaccines, uh, which, would, which would administer doses to Australians um, and I should say vaccinate them fully under those programs twice over. But on top of that, we've ensured that we've reinforced our manufacturing capability for important vaccines. I'm advised today that Australia is only one of 20 countries that can manufacture th these vaccines. One of 20 countries. So once again, we, we enter into an elite circle of countries 
that is being able to respond on behalf of their population. But Brendan? Thank you. So the, we, the, no warnings were ignored at all about the possibility of false positives was uh, raised by the University of Queensland researchers very early on. It was seen as a very, very unlikely possibility because the fragment of the HIV virus molecule was small, very unlikely, and it was unfortunately an unexpectedly high rate of false positives that resulted when the data came in. This was very clearly known at the time and the risks were appropriately taken and unfortunately it just became a bigger problem than anyone had anticipated. Pream, can I just in terms of um, sort of the broader picture here, we've um, three of the leaders around you have had elections this year, but we now seem to have a window, a clear window ahead, except for Mr McGowan next year has an election, but we have a period now sort of relatively free of election politics. Is there any recognition amongst the group either at dinner last night or the meeting today or even in this afternoon's gathering uh, that this is, a, this is an opportunity to tackle a bit of serious reform in the Federation with regard to the economic challenges you all face as state leaders and as a, as a, as a Commonwealth that no one has the immediate pressures of an election to contend with and you might be able to you know, take a few sticky decisions. Well, thanks, Phil, and I'm happy to th um, defer to my colleagues on this as well. One of the standing items on the National Cabinet agenda, which was a agreed and suggested by the Premier of New South Wales, who's been an advocate on this front as a treasurer, as a Premier, and, uh, and, and we've, we've made quite a lot of progress, I've got to say, this year. And having It's not just about whether there are elections or not. It's frankly if you've got the right systems in place to achieve it. And the National Cabinet now and its six priority reform committees that sit beneath it on energy, on regional Australia, on skills and a range of other areas, they now provide I think, the proper structures and systems which actually can deliver more. And so there is a standing item. I mean, today we're, we're doing with occupational licensing. Um, it seems like a small thing, but it's actually a very big thing. There are bigger things that we are very keen to discuss which go to the switching uh, of what Commonwealth may do and what states may do in important areas. And we're, we've undertaken to look at those areas for next year. But I think we've got the structure right to achieve that, whether there's an election or, or not. Um, I think we've got the model right for how we can get through some of those decisions. But Gladys, did you want to make a comment? Oh, the, thanks, PM. I just wanted to echo the PM's comments. I think we do have a great opportunity to keep the momentum going in reducing red tape and streamlining, improving, modernising state federal relations around a whole range of things. And I was um, pleased the PM's putting as a standing item that agenda item so that if there's anything we want to put on there, we can actually resolve it. And I think National Cabinet's de demonstrated our ability to get things done more quickly. And what COVID has taught all of us as state jurisdictions, but I think also as a, as a national government, is, is that you can do things better and differently. And let's use this opportunity to keep improving the quality of life of our citizens and streamlining our processes. I think we've also had an extra bit of confidence to say Australia can actually punch above its weights in terms of responding to global issues like this and let's let's use that confidence and that momentum to make real positive change and I'm delighted that that's what we'll be doing moving forward. Yeah I might just say yeah, too please. that um, I think we should um, you know gloss over the fact too that this um, National Cabinet has worked in the best interest of all Australians that um, you know we haven't met face to face for nine months but during that time we've had 30 National Cabinet meetings. We have been provided at all times with expert advice on health and at all times expert advice on the economy. So that has been absolutely critical to the way the National Cabinet has worked and how I think it's going to work into the future. And as long as there's that goodwill amongst everyone, uh, you will see um, substantial change that's happening with the cohesiveness of this group working together. Yes, John. On the environmental protection and biodiversity speeding up the administrative processes, um, how will that single touch point work at the state level? What pro projects and sort of industries do you think might benefit? And given that the states control a lot of the levers in this area, could I ask the Premiers of Victoria and Queensland, how committed are you to actually speeding up project and business kind of approvals in this area, uh, given there's often a lot of pushback from environmental groups and progressive activists? Well, on the first part, a single touch approval process means exactly that. There's a single touch. It'll be done by the states, ensuring that they reference and ensure that the federal standards are uh, uh, adhered to in the decisions that they make on projects. Now, this will um, relate to any projects, 
that require federal approval under the EPBC Act. And this means you go through one process, you go through one decision maker, uh, there will be a, an overarching um, assessment that is done on each state and how they're fulfilling that over the course of the year. But that's not an uh, appeal jurisdiction, that's not done on a case-by-case -case basis. That's just to ensure that the Commonwealth continues to have the assurance that the standards that are there and that are set at that level are being uh, appropriately addressed. So this is going to be a, a very big change, I think. We've tried to do this before, and that hasn't succeeded. And that's why I really want to thank uh, all the Premiers and Chief Ministers for their commitment to see this done faster. The standards have to be kept. And in the first step, we'll make sure that the standards that we have right now, that are part of existing laws, that won't change. That will be done and codified for the states to see next month. So they've got a clear idea of what those standards are. And then it is my great hope that when the parliament returns next year, we will be able to see passage of the legislation that can give effect to giving that authority to the states and territories. But I'll leave it to Dan and, and uh, Anna to speak to that. Just you, Questions. Is a, this is a logical extension of changes we've made at a Victorian level where we do planning and environmental effects assessments at the same time. So we run a dual track system so that instead of completing one and then beginning a fresh new process at the end of that and taking basically twice as long to build the road, rail, hospital, school, uh, important, fundamentally important infrastructure that we need now and for the future, we've sped that up. Uh, Now's the time to make good decisions, but make them as quickly as you can, because our economy and communities, not just in my state, but across the nation, need those jobs, that confidence, that sense of momentum. This is a really important change and one that we're pleased to support. It's, it's about how you make the decision, not the decision itself. It'll still be against the highest of standards, standards that I think we, at a jurisdictional level and nationally, are very well known for. Yeah, and I think we need to see the results of those standards to make sure that there is confidence out there in the public that they are high standards. And in you know some cases, um, everyone can sometimes say, oh, the states are holding up things. But in other instances, we've got projects where we're waiting on federal approvals. So I think it works both ways. And a streamlined process is, I think, uh, going to be well received by everybody. The standards, just to be clear, because you'll be aware of the Samuels report, uh, the first set of standards will be the standards that effectively are there now, and they need to be codified very clearly. Uh, not, a, not a comma more or a comma less um, when it comes to those standards. The second phase would relate to addressing recommendations of the Samuels report, which require a broader uh, discussion on, uh, I suppose, the, the overall substance of the standards themselves. We've got time for two more, I'm sorry, because we've got other things this afternoon. Prime Minister, can I ask you, do you want to put a stop to Victoria's Belt and Road Agreement with Beijing? And Premier Andrews, can I ask you, what is it you want to get out of the Belt and Road Agreement? And do you think it presents a sovereign risk? Well, we will um, uh, follow through on the uh, legislation that has passed the parliament in accordance with the process which is set there and make the appropriate assessments and then make any decisions from there. And, and, that, and I'm, I'm happy to add that that agreement, like all agreements that Victoria enters into, and I expect the Commonwealth and other states are no different. It's all about making sure that more Victorian product gets sent to our biggest and smallest customers. Uh, whether it's to China or any other part of the world, it's all about jobs. It's all about jobs. Uh, and, and I'll leave the Commonwealth Government to make their uh, assessments. But do you want to keep the Premier, is what I'm asking you. Well, we are, we are comfortable with the arrangements we have in place, but I'd be, I, if I could put it to you, I think that we'd be probably better off in our relationship if all of us focused on the fact that I think the Prime Minister and I and all of us that you're looking at, even the uh, professors, are all about having the best economic partnerships with customers large and small in every part of the world, because that means jobs and prosperity and profitability for families back home. Contentious issue to another one. Border battles have obviously dominated National Cabinet. Have the New South Wales and Queensland Premiers managed to resolve your personal differences? You've been feuding via dueling press conferences. And do either of you have regrets about the decision you made on the borders? No. Um, you do it all again. It's all based on health advice that I was given, and I will protect Queensland every single day. Your response? Uh, my response is, uh, contrary to um, what might be out there, uh, we have constructive dialogue within National Cabinet. Um, uh, and I've made my position on borders very clear from day one, and I maintain that position. And I guess that's the beauty of the Federation. It allows, um, although 
from time to time we won't agree on everything. It allows us to, uh, to, to come forward with our own views on how to move forward. Um, and I'm pleased now, as the PM said, the, the important thing is we'll all be open by Christmas. And I think that's what our citizens want and expect. Mm. And I hope that uh, this is sustained until the end of the pandemic. So I would, we don't want to go backwards. When Australia, and we're going to have to leave it there. When Australia was established as a nation, um, it was done to federate states. If when Australia was established as a nation, the idea was that there should be only one government in the country, well, that's what they would have done. But they didn't make that call. They made the call to have states and territories. And as a federal nation, I think one of the things that we have demonstrated this year is that, of course, there's going to be differences between states and territories from time to time. I think the assessment that is made that if there's, a dis if there's a difference of view or a disagreement, then somehow the Federation is not working is again, I think, a very naive view. Um, the Federation's working. The Federation has worked for Australia. And most importantly, it's got Australia working in one of the most important years that we've had and the challenges we've faced in many generations. Thank you all very much.